Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Maryland Tech Council Executive Insight Series. I'm Marty Rosendale, CEO of the Maryland Tech Council. And the Maryland Tech Council is the industry trade association that represents technology and life science companies throughout the state of Maryland. The Executive Insight Series, uh, just as the title suggests, it's an opportunity to hear from experts uh, across the country on, on, on challenges, issues, things that, that face our businesses and industries every day. Um, today, just to let you know, I will be monitoring the chat room and the Q&A, so if you have any questions or comments that you would like to make, feel free to put them into the chat room or into the Q&A uh, area. You should find both icons at the bottom of your screen. Our guest today is Dr. Timothy Wee. Dr. Wee is an Associate Director with Moody's Analytics. Uh, Dr. Wee, welcome this morning. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Right. So, so Dr. Wee, maybe you could just take a minute, talk about, you know, what it took to get to where you are with Moody's. I know, I know that your experience spans academic industry as well as policy organizations. You know, give us a sense of, of, about yourself and how you got to this point. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm an associate director at Moody's, as, um, as Marty mentioned. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a PhD and an economics PhD from Minnesota. Um, who has also been a fellow at the University of Cambridge. Um, I've also worked in consulting and banking industries, as well as um, a few central banks, um, the Bank of Canada, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, um, and also kind of um, working um, on research in tandem with, with other organizations like the IMF in the past. So, so certainly I've, I've run the gamut in terms of having worked at, you know, at industry, uh, kind of um, in sort of the public sector, as well as in academia. Great. And now, more recently, you've been focused on supply chain issues, correct? That's right. Yeah. So as part of my responsibilities at Moody's, um, I am essentially our resident um, chip shortage and supply chain expert. Um, and last year, um, a lot of the, the articles and the research that I did um, caught significant coverage um, in, you know, CNN, CNBC, Al Jazeera, The Times, like you name it. Um, uh, all these big media publications um, have cited um, the important work that, that we've done here at Moody's on supply chains, and, and I've been kind of at the forefront of that. Great. So I know you've got some slides for us this morning and, and a presentation, so why don't you go ahead and share your screen and um, jump right into your presentation. Sure thing. So give me one sec here. All right. Do you guys see the first slide? Yes. All right, well, if that's the case, um, let's, let's do it. All right, so thanks so much uh, to everyone uh, for dialing in. Um, today, I'll be talking about supply chains, um, shortages, and inflation, our outlook for 2022. Um, and these views are my own, obviously, um, even though I work for, for Moody's, as Marty mentioned. Um, and let me start out by kind of just giving you a lay of the land, right? I think kind of what we expect to see in the near term. And the kind of one line summary is that these supply chain disruptions and inflation that we've seen kind of really crop up um, late last year will very likely ensue in 2022. Um, we've seen a lot of production related issues. So things related to quantities in 2021, I think these will be compounded by price related issues. So the quantity issues probably are not gonna disappear. I think you're still gonna see a lot of shortages, but now we have this kind of double whammy where prices are rising as well. Um, Omicron is very likely to amplify these issues. Um, I will qualify that um, a little bit later when I make a comparison between Omicron and Delta. Um, certainly there's also another new Omicron variant that's just been um, reported in the news. Um, but, but these new variants, they will, they will amplify these issues because you know, shortages are already rampant, particularly in labor for certain industries. And the border and factory closures that come from you know, these types of disruptions will rattle um, global production and trade. Uh, I'll, I'll give a bit more, I'll sort of provide more color in terms of how I see uh, some of these supply chain issues resolving later in the year. Um, but I think that the thing that's gonna be even harder to resolve um, are these labor shortages. Um, and certainly illness, I think we've seen uh, a lot more people sort of falling sick um, because of how, how transmissible this new variant has been um, will complicate this. Um, there's also the kind of interesting um, interplay between different um, COVID-19 policies in different countries. So in particular, I think the West 
you know, and by that I mean, you know, US, Canada, Europe kind of tend to tend to sort of just, you know, continue um, despite cases being at record highs um, in contrast to some of the more conservative Asian countries like China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan that basically adopt a zero COVID policy. Um, uh, there is trade-offs between these two um, different policies, right? Um, on the one hand, certainly, I think if you continue, you run the risk of, um, you know, the, the hospitalizations and the deaths essentially overwhelming the healthcare system. Um, but then if you just completely shut cities down, you know, it, at the site of, of a single case or, or you know, an outbreak, um, you also run the risk of stymieing the, the economy. So, so I think there are some trade-offs there that, that you know, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, later on. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll talk about kind of the hawkish monetary policy that I think we're, we're going to expect to see um, later this year to combat inflation. We've already heard a lot um, uh, of comments from, from, from you know, um, our Fed chair and, and they're very likely to follow through on that. Um, and, and so, you know, rates are, are already going up. The market's already reacted to this. Um, they're, they're still, you know, in some sense, digesting um, how, how aggressively the Fed has kind of changed their tone um, over the past couple months. Um, but, but I think, you know, with, with higher rates um, to combat inflation, um, that'll certainly tend to grow. So again, kind of just making sure that everyone's kind of on the same playing field. Um, I thought that I would start out by, by giving a very brief summary of kind of economic activity in the US, um, broadly speaking. Um, over the past month, um, we've seen growth moderating, weakness particularly in kind of leisure hospitality, no surprise there. Um, that's been the case for most of the pandemic. Uh, manufacturing agriculture still in expansion. So, so these supply chain disruptions they're not really coming from, you know, supply being so hampered um, that, that we're producing way less than, than before. That's, that's no longer the case, right? Now it's just demand sort of outstripping supply. Um, payroll growth is stymied by um, labor shortages. Um, and, and of course, you know, when you have something in shortage, typically that leads to prices rising and, and here the prices are the wages. So wage growth, particularly strong in low wage industries, Elevated um, input and procurement costs um, contributing to high prices, um, and, and by high prices, I mean high output prices. Um, we've already seen Omicron disrupting economic activity in most major cities. Um, and even with the data that's already come in for New York and Philadelphia, um, you know, we've seen some, some early signs of lower consumer demand. Um, faster and higher interest rate hikes expected from the Fed, as mentioned earlier. And then there's been a, a really significant broad sell-off in the stock market um, from the expectation of higher rates um, and continued uncertainty from Omicron. So that's kind of where we are right now, right? Um, in the US as a whole. And then if, you know, if we drill down into Maryland um, and we look at the latest Fed survey, um, it indicates that the business, condition, this business conditions are weakening. Um, even if sort of economic activity for the fifth district has remained strong, um, you know, and part of this is because, you know, backlogs have remained really extended, right? That's a, a sure sign of supply chains um, being hampered, right? When, when you have significant backlogs and really long delivery times. Um, and inventories are basically at, at very low levels, um, in some places at historic lows. Uh, firms um, that were surveyed were less optimistic about future sales and reduced hours. Um, and, you know, whenever you have this sort of dynamic, um, you expect that, you know, um, uh, that, that, that there will be kind of weaker business conditions. At the same time, firms still had difficulty finding workers. And this is something that I'll talk about again, a little bit more later um, in terms of this job mismatch, um, because they've, they're, they're finding you know, difficulty uh, in terms of you know, really getting the workers with the right skills. Um, and again, with scarcity comes you know, higher prices. Um, growth of prices paid and received by firms both increased. So we have seen both output and input prices increase. But I think the important thing to note here is that input price growth has outpaced output price growth, um, indicating that there are really supply chain disruption issues um, and input shortage issues, and that a lot of these higher input costs can't simply be passed on to, to the end consumer. So now uh, in terms of the, 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 the path forward, right? So, so now that we're kind of hopefully all on, on, on the same starting page, um, I'll talk about supply chains, then talk about shortages and how that leads to inflation and I'll conclude. So 
in terms of supply chains, before I delve into the details of this chart, I just want to kind of level set everyone in terms of um, there are multiple links to to any supply chain, right? Um, you know, and, and in a typical supply chain, um, you'll see that you know you have this this you know this product that's being produced, right? And then that product has to be shipped, right? So shipping involves moving from port to port, right? Um, and in that particular link, you can already see that potentially there's going to be issues um, if ports are um, congested, right? Similarly, there's also gonna be an issue if shipping rates are really, really high. And that's essentially what this graph is showing you um, in terms of freight costs that have risen by over 200% in the last year alone. Um, and, and this is not something that we've seen really um, for the better part of the last decade. Um, but to kind of continue on that chain, right? So, so even assuming that it reaches the port, um, you still have to unload this cargo, right? And unloading that cargo requires, um, you know, certain equipment like chassis and things like that. Um, and those are again, limited supply, um, kind of exacerbating the, the, the port congestion. Um, and, and, and as well, there's a truck driver shortage. So that's kind of the next piece of, of, um, of, of the supply chain disruptions that we're seeing right now. Um, and then from the trucks, even assuming you are able to get a truck, right, to move kind of your goods from, from the ports to, to the railway, which is the next link in the chain, um, there's also been issues with, with our rail workers. Um, certainly the administration has done, the current administration has done what they can, right, to help to try to help resolve these issues. They've operated the ports of Long Beach and LA 24-7. Um, they've worked with a lot of, um, you know, private companies to really try to get you know, goods flowing, right, um, through the system. And, and if you look at the throughput, right, through the system, they have improved a lot. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, these main ports of Long Beach and, and LA and many other ports around the world, right, this is not a, uh, a uniquely American problem, right? This is a problem in Europe, this is a problem in Asia. Um, uh, we, we we're just seeing that, you know, this um, focus on, on goods, right? Um, the fact that we've been kind of pent up inside, right? Like there's this pent up demand, right, as economists like to call it, because, We've been cooped up inside in our homes. We haven't really had that 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 opportunity to go out and travel as much as we'd like, um, or to enjoy, you know, all these other types of, you know, services, right? Whether it be um, going to a concert, you know, or eating out, things like that. Um, it hasn't been as easy to do that um, during the pandemic, um, and as a result of that, there has just been a focus of a focus on goods, right, rather than services, um, leading to, to to a lot of this increased demand. Um, so. So with the rail workers, um, the administration has actually worked to kind of um, uh, strike a deal with Union Pacific, which is one of the biggest rail operators in the country. And again, that's helping, but it's not fully resolving this issue. So part of the reason why it's very hard to fix these issues is that there are some secular trends, right? Long-term trends that basically make it hard to, to just get rid of the truck driver shortage or the rail worker shortage, right? Um, the median age for truck drivers has risen over the past couple of decades. Now it's a sitting at, I believe, 54 the last time I checked. Um, and it's not coming down anytime soon. Um, I think we really need to find a couple of different ways to try to resolve that, right? I mean, the, the administration is talking about expediting licenses, right? I think we also need really younger people to join the profession and we need technology, right? We need technology to get better um, so that we're able to, to hopefully automate a lot of these processes. And then from rails, you also have warehouses. So that's the next part of the supply chain. Um, and warehouse capacity is, is essentially at max right now. The last time I checked, I mean, it was around 97%. There are very few warehouses that are easily accessible and available um, you know, at, 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 at any notice. Um, and I think you know, with that, um, you know, again, it, there's, there are also some other compounding factors in terms of regulations around you know, how much um, you know, land can be developed and developed for what purpose, um, leading to essentially um, every link of the supply chain, right? From, from the shipping to the, the trucks, to the rails, to the warehouses, um, just being disrupted. Um, and the pandemic kind of really, you know, sort of directing our focus on, on goods as opposed to services has, has really exacerbated that. Um, so it, it kind of just to look at the slide more specifically, um, this really talks about kind of um, the, the WCI freight rate is kind of a, a world composite rate. So that's kind of an average, if you will. Um, because obviously there are all kinds of different routes all around the world. You'll see that that rose again very significantly in the past year, um, over 200%. Shanghai, LA, these are the two busiest ports um, in uh, North America and Asia. 
Um, and so I plot them there for, you know, to, just to show how that rise has been even more dramatic, um, over 300% in the past year. Shanghai Rotterdam, Rotterdam is a very big um, European port. Again, very similar dynamics um, with the freight rates um, increasing significantly. I'll talk about kind of the implications um, for in inflation and how we quantify that later in the, um, in the presentation. So when you ship these goods, right, you, you not only need to pay a shipping fee, you also need to pay for the containers that ship them. And a lot of the reason why, you know, the, the supply chain disruptions have been so pervasive is that the container costs themselves have risen dramatically, um, again, over 200%. This is an index um, for all these different um, combinations. Um, again, this is kind of proxied, North America proxied by Long Beach LA, Asia proxied by Shanghai, Europe proxied by Rotterdam. Um, and, and the reason for the container cost skyrocketing is, is also because um, containers can get stuck in ports, right? So if you go back to kind of what we were talking about earlier in terms of you know, different countries having different COVID-19 policies, you know, if China decides to shut down the port of Ningbo, for instance, which they have in the past couple of weeks because of an outbreak there, and that's a very significant port, then you have the containers there um, being stuck in that particular port for several weeks, right? Um, and we saw that throughout 2021, right? Because um, as, as, as you may know, countries have recovered from COVID-19 um, at different rates, right? Um, and we experienced kind of the Delta waves and the Delta spikes. Um, at different points throughout the year. Um, and so you can, you can imagine what that does, right? In terms of, you know, if a container was stuck in China earlier in the year, but then, um, you know, they, they eventually recovered, it will take some time for those containers to really get sent to a lot of the other countries. But by the time those containers get sent to these other countries, um, those countries may have already had, um, uh, or may, maybe starting their Delta spike um, last year, right? So, so, so then those containers get stuck again um, and, and just basically creates this domino effect throughout the system leading to these container costs being really high because it's, it's quite hard to make containers from scratch. Um, so you kind of really, at least in terms of um, uh, in the short run, all you can do is really make use of, of the existing supply. Um, so, so that existing container supply became quite scarce last year. So moving on to the truck shortage, um, here you can see kind of, again, like an index of, of truck demand versus supply. Once again, demand just far outweighing supply last year. Um, this is kind of um, starting to cool down a little bit. I think that's great. Um, uh, you know, but again, this is something where there are some long-term demographic trends that kind of lead to um, the shortage being quite difficult to resolve, right? I think unless you really get some new you know, like new cohorts of, of, of truck drivers or automated cars or alternative means by which to transport goods from ports to, to rails or to, work, to, to warehouses, um, it's gonna be quite difficult to just completely um, uh, get rid of this altogether. So here we have a measure of lead time and, and lead time is basically um, the amount of time it takes to not just produce a product, but to get that product from the original point of production to the end consumer, right? Um, and, and, you know, uh, supply chains are very global in nature. In many cases, think about a car, right? How you would produce a car. Um, there's a lot of back and forth um, in many different countries um, and sourcing from many different countries in order to produce that one car that we're able to drive out in the streets. Um, so the, the, the measure of lead times basically um, kind of encapsulates all that in like one um, nice little metric. And you'll see here that global manufacturing lead times are essentially at their highest in two decades. Um, they've started to come down a little bit from their peak, but, but certainly still very much elevated and likely to, to stay there. So hopefully now I've, I've, I've given you kind of a, a, a good understanding of sort of supply chains, the different links within, you know, um, each of these supply chains and kind of some of the issues. Um, now I'll move on to kind of shortages. Um, and here I'll focus on two types of shortages. The first one being labor, um, because I think this is really something that, you know, is going to be with us for a while. Um, you know, and, and again, the reason for this is that, you know, the, 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 the funny thing about our economy right now is that we're actually doing very well in terms of unemployment being very low, you know, um, you know uh, growth being quite high, you know, um, we've recovered well past pre-pandemic levels, um, you know, economy's churning, right? Um, 
Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, it's, it's being increasingly apparent that, you know, there, there is really significant tightness um, in the labor markets and it's, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult for certain companies essentially to find the right workers, um, the workers with the right skills um, that they need. And here, you know, is like a measure of the percentage of, of you as businesses that, that have hard to fill job openings available. And you can see, again, significantly higher than anything we've seen um, in the past couple of decades. Um, so, so with, with la labor market tightness, um, we do see um, you know, wage growth finally catching up. So, so here I think the interesting thing to, 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 to note is that the two don't always go in parallel, right? In fact, in many times, you'll see that um, wage growth lags um, kind of the, the labor market tightness and also that it doesn't necessarily follow, right? Um, that just because labor market conditions are tight that you, know, you necessarily have wage growth. There have been periods in other countries where you know, wages have been fairly stagnant. Um, for a very long period of time, um, and 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 even here in the U.S., they were they were you know kind of pretty level in terms of real wages um, for for a long period of time, but but because of kind of how how um, how well we've done in the past year and how how strongly the 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 labor markets are are um, are are kind of at capacity right now, um, we are finally seeing um, wage growth, um, in particular wage growth in uh, lower wage industries. Um, really being, you know, really picking up over the past couple months. So I'll, here I'll talk a little bit about um, energy, um, because again, this is something that kind of um, is, I think, uh, uh, a type of shortage that we will see more of um, uh, throughout the year. Um, and here, I think the, the ironic thing is that, you know, as we move towards a more sort of, you know, carbon um, friendly environment, um, you know, a more carbon friendly world. Um, I think, you know, it, it's created this sort of paradoxical um, result where because um, there is under investment now in, um, under investment relative to what it was in the past, right? Um, in some of these fossil fuel type um, uh, energy sources, but the demand for that has kind of stayed relatively constant um, as we make this transition. Um, energy prices have really gone up. Um, and, and, and our forecast is for these energy prices to, to stay pretty high this year because of that. Um, you know, capital spending is typically needed in order to resolve um, a lot of these shortages, right? You really need new capacity to come online to meet the increased demand, right? Or to make up for the shortfall in supply. Um, and, if, and if that doesn't happen, then, then you will have these persistently higher prices. This is um, no more apparent than in Europe, um, where here, I think, you know, as people that live in the US, I think, you know, you'll be very happy to find out that our energy prices are nothing like what Europe is seeing right now. And, and what Europe is seeing right now is really, you know, a combination of a lot of factors, right? I mean, you know, the, the permit prices have really gone up, you know, they're very reliant on, um, on Russian energy. Um, and this is um, I mentioned this not just because, um, you know, it, it's not really so much about the, the, the Russian focus as much as I think it's indicative of a, a bigger um, sort of uh, process at work where I think a lot of supply chains in the past have been very, very specialized um, and they've had very few sources. Um, and what happens when you have very few sources and those sources become unreliable or, you know, become stymied by, you know, by the pandemic or a weather event or something, you know, something else, then, you know, you, you find yourself at a loss for how to respond, right? So I think um, in terms of supply chains and kind of what, what, you know, a lot of companies are doing right now is you're really exploring a lot of alternative sourcing mechanisms, right? Whether it's depending on local sources, right? Um, really hooking up with local suppliers or even bringing operations in-house, right? Um, as well as really trying to simplify the supply chain, right? There are a couple of notable country, uh, companies there like Tesla that have done a good job of that in terms of, of really reducing their reliance on, on some key suppliers um, because of the chip shortage, um, which I'll talk a little bit more of um, very shortly. Um, and, and again, there was also bad weather, um, but you can see that energy prices throughout Europe, you know, for Spain, France, Germany, the UK is the same. They've really skyrocketed in the past year. So speaking of chips, um, uh, this is uh, 
an issue that's kind of near and dear to, to, to my heart because it's, you know, I cover Taiwan for, for Moody's and, and you know, um, Taiwan is basically the, the biggest manufacturer of chips worldwide. Um, you know, it accounts for 92% of all the leading edge chips um, and leading edge are basically those are seven nanometers or less. So these are kind of the, the, the chips that are at the, the frontier the research frontier. Um, you know, chips that are used in phones, computers, things like that, um, you know, the vast majority, the bulk of that is being manufactured in Taiwan. Um, if you look at the chip lead times, they've really gone up um, over time. Um, I, you know, I point, point you to this um, green curve, right? And you can see that in the past year in particularly, it's really accelerated. And there's very good reasons for that, right? Um, part of it is that, you know, the pandemic has really accelerated this digitization, right? This process of digitizing everything, putting everything on the cloud, um, you know, trying to really do everything remotely, you know, whether it's, you know, um, working remotely from home or doing a lot more things inside the home as well. Um, there's been shortage of chips for gaming consoles, for instance, um, increased demand for increased demand for all kinds of electronic gadgets. Um, and that's the future, right? The future is that we will see a lot more chip applications, you know, whether it's the internet of things, artificial intelligence, 5G that is coming on, here in the US and that's been around in other countries. Um, I think all of these things basically rely on chips. And the thing with chips is that, um, I'll go back to that, but um, I just wanted to show you this, right? So, so it's a very concentrated industry, right? There's really very few countries that kind of manufacture chips. And so, so again, here, maybe I'll, I'll kind of give everyone sort of maybe a, a broad overview before diving to specifics. So, so there's a couple of different processes that need to happen before a chip is made, right? So at first it needs to be designed. A lot of that design still happens in the US and in Europe. Um, there's a little bit in Japan as well. Um, and that's usually kind of where the intellectual property is, right? So it makes sense that I think a lot of, um, you know, uh, kind of researchers here, as well as in other kind of highly developed countries um, are at the forefront of that. Um, and then after the, the chips have kind of been designed, then they basically get sent to be manufactured. And this manufacturing piece is kind of really where Taiwan, Korea, um, and then a couple other Asian countries like Malaysia um, uh, essentially take the lead, right? Um, and there are many different kinds of chips, right? So it's not, it's not all the same, right? So I mentioned high-end chips earlier, the chips that are seven nanometers or less, those are primarily manufactured in Taiwan and Korea. The chips that you often hear about are the chips um, that are used in, in, in cars. And in fact, those chips are, are, tend to be older um, generation chips. So, so significantly larger in size. Um, and the, the reason why the, the chip shortage for those older chips um, are in some sense um, more severe than, than, than the shortages for the newer chips is because there's much less um, new supply that's coming on for, for these older chips, right? The, if you look at the, the financials of TSMC. TSMC is the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the biggest um, chip making company in the world. Half of their, their revenues are basically coming from, from the high-end chips alone, right? So from, from these like, not just high-end chips, but like phone applications alone, right? So that tells you, and, and auto is basically only account for less than 10% of their revenues. So that tells you how important the high-end chips are to these chip making companies. And hence, they're, they're incentivized to basically produce a lot more of these newer end chips, right? Because they have higher margins. Um, but, that, but that means that then, you know, a lot of the, the producers that rely on the lower end chips find it very difficult um, to ramp up production if they're, you know, um, really reliant on, 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 on a lot of these chips, right? So that's the other thing about, about higher end versus lower end chips in terms of phone applications, you typically only really need a handful of chips. Sometimes even one chip would be good enough. The chip is really good. Um, with cars, you need thousands of chips to make one single car. Um, so you really need the, the, the production um, to kind of uh, be, be scaled enough um, in order to meet that need um, that's coming from, from the auto sector. Um, and, and that hasn't really happened yet. Um, suffice to say, I think the, the, you know, the ship industry is growing. Um, CapEx last year was very significant, um, you know, well over 20%, um, much higher than it ever has been um, in the past decade. And it's also um, you know, going to be growing again this year. Um, and, and there's efforts throughout the world, right? Um, whether it's the US, there's a lot of plants being built here in the US by TSMC, by Intel, by Samsung. 
um, or, or places like China. Japan has already negotiated a deal for KSMP to build a plant there to serve their auto industry. Um, you know, India is doing the same thing. Um, so there's a, a lot of developments worldwide, right? Um, but, but this is something that I think we will continue to see more of uh, moving forward. So I, I did promise to talk a little bit about Omicron and Delta. And I think this is where um, it's, it's important to have some context, right? For kind of how, how, how significant these disruptions are potentially going to be um, moving forward. Um, I think when Delta struck in the middle of last year, the key thing to note is that vaccinations for a lot of these key countries, right? Um, Malaysia, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, were much, much lower levels than they are now, right? And to the extent that we, we know now that, you know, the vaccines and especially, you know, boosters help um, to raise, um, you know, our, our, our defenses against the, the new variants, um, the fact that um, these countries are now significantly more um, vaccinated, in many cases, um, essentially having achieved some sort of um, herd resilience, um, it's unlikely that we will see the factory closures that um, you know, we saw last year. So in that sense, um, you know, Omicron should not be as disruptive as Delta. Um, the caveat here is, again, um, that there are countries like China, right, um, where they are um, you know, they really want to contain the virus um, and, and they have this COVID zero policy. So they will have these um, factory shutdowns, which, which have happened in, in, in cities like Xi'an, for instance, um, a major city, a population over 10 million. Um, you know, but, but again, these, we expect these lockdowns to be kind of um, you know, limited um, and localized. Um, so hopefully it won't have too big of an impact. It's certainly not as big of an impact as um, the Delta wave had um, late last year. So chips and autos, again, kind of recurring story. I've talked about it a little bit, um, but the projection is that, you know, the, the reliance of, 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 of autos on chips is, is only gonna grow over time. So, so this is really something that, you know, I think both sides, right? Whether it's the automakers or the chip makers, I think they really have to, to come to terms with, with how they're gonna deal with this. Um, because, because certainly I think there is an incentive, I think, to get um, more chips to the automakers so that you know, they are able to, to, to make the goods that they need. So let me now move on to how kind of a supply chain really um, induce inflation. Um, in the interest of time, I'll try to keep this, this discussion brief, but, but in essence, there are again, many steps through which um, uh, you know, these supply chain disruptions um, really feed through to consumer prices, right? And, and here I've kind of broken it down into four, right? So the first step is for transportation costs to, to raise input costs, right? Um, and, you know, these input costs could be, you know, um, you know, raw inputs like commodities, intermediate inputs, right? So again, think of a car, right? How many times, you know, these, these um, gadgets that then are made in one country, get sent to another, that's used as an intermediate input for a different gadget that's made in another country. And then that second gadget gets sent to yet a third country that then uses that as an input to produce something else that they can get sent to, to, to say a plant in Detroit. And then that, that, you know, sort of that fourth country is where that um, electron, the final electronic gadget is actually put together um, and put into a car. Um, so these, these in intermediate costs, um, essentially eventually feed into higher downstream in input costs, right? So again, think of that story where you have, you know, um, uh, an output good from, from country one, right? Being used as an input good for country two um, and, and so forth, right? And so eventually these intermediate costs, um, and there's a domino effect, right? That's the kind of message that I want to send across. There's a multiplier, right? Um, that's at work. Um, and eventually these output costs get passed through to the consumer. Now, how much of it gets passed through is, is certainly a, a question up for debate. And there's a lot of empirical studies on that. It depends a lot on not just the type of product, but also kind of the country and the location and things of that nature. Um, but, but here, I think what I, I do wanna say is that, um, you know, there's, there's again, kind of these if you will, three pieces to, to the inflationary impact, right? The first thing is the, the shipping costs, right? Which we've already seen have risen over 200%. The intermediate input content of uh, final goods, right? So that's kind of this 
um, how much of this final good is, is really just manufactured like literally on site. There's still some goods that are manufactured like that, right? Where you don't really need to use a lot of intermediate goods. Um, but by and large, right, all the kind of big, um, you know, manufactured goods that we're so used to, to consuming, you know, these laptop computers, these cars, a lot of them require a lot of intermediate input. And with that comes essentially a higher multiplier effect. Um, and then there's the question of how much is passed through to the consumer, right? Um, you know, how much, and, and here there are a lot of factors at play, right? Like there's how much bargaining power does the consumer have, right? Are they able to choose among many different producers? Um, how differentiated is the good, right? Is it a good that's uniquely manufactured or that's only provided by one or two companies, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, is it easily substitutable? The, do the do the companies have have um, you know uh, monopoly power? Um, are there regulations around kind of how many businesses can operate um, in that particular um, state or in that country? So many, many, many factors go into how much. Um, of these higher input costs are eventually uh, passed on to the consumer. And it's just an example, right? So, so if we look at 3% um, of the total cost, and I use 3% because that is actually the average um, uh, percent of uh, total cost that's due to shipping. Um, at 3% total cost, 10% rise in shipping costs. And we've seen shipping costs rise more than that. Um, but, you know, um, and they've kind of started to plateau now, right? But, but in the event that they, they rise even further, um, uh, that would result in a 30 basis point direct impact and total cost. Um, I've spoken about this input output, that's that uh, multiplier, right? Um, and if you look at the input output tables for the US, that multiplier is 1.65, that would result in a combined impact of 50 basis points. Um, and then if you assume 50% pass through, again, this is kind of an average number, um, varies a lot by product, you know, and, and again, by all those factors that we just talked about, that result in 25 basis point impact on consumer prices. And the last piece that I haven't mentioned, and this is gonna, I think, you know, hopefully um, segue nicely into our inflation discussion, is that a lot of prices are sticky, right? So what that means is that, you know, think about like a, when you go to a restaurant, right? Like restaurants can't just change menu prices immediately, right? Um, just because the price of chicken has gone up, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the fried chicken that you consume is automatically going to go up, right? Usually it takes some time, right, before um, restaurants adjust their prices. Um, but then once they adjust those prices, typically they also stick around for a very long time. Um, so, so it's this combination of basically having this delay as well as this persistence after it's happened um, that I think is going to to really translate um, into kind of uh, persistent inflation from these supply chain disruptions moving forward. So in terms of inflation, let me just kind of paint a broad picture here. This is percent annualized quarterly changes global again, an average nature. Um, uh, and you can see that um, the measure is very, very high, right? So I think this kind of tells you that um, some of the highest in the past couple of decades. And I think this tells you that what we're seeing here in the US is not just a uniquely US phenomenon, but is happening um, all around the world um, to varying degrees. And this is kind of more US specific um, data from the BLS, BA. You'll see that again, kind of at really um, the highest levels that it's been in, 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 a, in the last couple of decades. And, and, and the Fed is aware of this, right? Like the Fed is now really acting to try to, um, to, to mitigate um, higher inflation, but, but for all of the reasons that we've mentioned earlier, right? The shortages, the, the supply chain disruptions, Omicron, these new variants that are popping up, um, we do see this inflation lasting for a while. Um, along with kind of higher input prices, eventually, you know, companies do have to raise um, um, output prices as well, um, you know, because otherwise margins get squeezed. And so here we see output price growth, right? And then this is kind of, from a survey, right, percentage of U.S. businesses planning to rate pri raise prices, and you can see over half of U.S. businesses are planning, planning to raise prices. So, so certainly, I think something that we should all be cognizant about, and and something that we should expect um, in the next coming coming months. And then this is an indicative of basically how tight um, the goods market has been, right? So, if you look at sales to inventory, um, I started out by talking about how inventory levels are really very low, and here you can see the private in inventories um, have really, um, you know, have have shrunk essentially um, in the past couple 
couple of uh, quarters. And the reason for that is that a lot of companies have really drawn down their inventories, right? Um, because of these supply chain disruptions. Um, and then, you know, conversely, on the other end, you have like, you know, because of this shift towards goods, you have final sales growing um, significantly. And so the higher this, um, uh, this gap between sales and inventory, inventories, um, the higher, the bigger that gap is, then the, the, you know, the more likely we are going to see um, higher inflation, right? Because, um, you know, ev eventually companies will have to charge um, higher prices for the, these increasingly scarce goods. So this is really, I think, where I see kind of the supply chain issue being resolved eventually, right? I think what we really need to see, and we've seen, we, we saw a little bit of this, um, like late last year, where there, there's a gradual shift towards um, services, right? Like finally, I think, um, you know, people started traveling. Um, you know, I traveled back to Canada where I'm originally from, you know, um, late last year. And I think a lot of people took the opportunity as well to, to see family over Thanksgiving, over Christmas. Um, and, and that's the type of dynamic that we really want to see um, if we want to, to have a resolution of a lot of these supply chain disruptions, because what the pandemic did was it really kind of cooped us inside, right? And so what that meant is that, you know, we really had, didn't really have too many outlets in terms of, you know, um, for our consumption in terms of services, right? So we couldn't really go out to the movies, you know, we couldn't really um, eat out as much as we'd like. Um, and before Omicron and struck, um, you know, we, we were finally able to start doing that. Um, but then again, now you kind of have uh, a bit of a slowdown in economic activity as far as service consumption is concerned. Um, but I think the, 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 the hope is that eventually, um, you know, things really go back to normal and that normalization um, will help ease the pressures um, on, on, on the goods producers, which will then in turn help ease inflationary pressures. And this is just kind of like a, a graph that, that shows you exactly that, right? That, that a lot of the inflation that you're seeing right now is really primarily coming from goods, right? Like the, the blue line here, right? Like huge spike um, over the past couple of years, exactly because of the reason I mentioned in terms of the pandemic really directing um, uh, our, our consumption uh, kind of um, efforts into to goods as opposed to services. So uh, in the interest of time, I won't talk about this too much, but I, I did want to give a bit of a, you know, maybe a, a couple of minutes like spiel on, on industries kind of, because uh, I, I understand that we, we have, you know, um, various industries uh, represented um, by the Tech Council. Um, I think the, the, the uh, profitability last year was really, really high, um, you know, in, 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 in some part due to, I think, you know, pretty generous um, government transfers. Um, you know, I think that really helped to keep the economy going. Um, and while we see kind of, um, I think things normalizing this year, um, uh, the, the thing that we, we can also expect to see, I think, is that we will see kind of this shift, right? I think last year we saw kind of a shift starting already um, from kind of the bigger tech names like the Googles and the Amazons to the more cyclical names. Um, and the financials in particular, I think, which, which stand to benefit greatly from, from higher rates, right? I think these are kind of some of the, some of the sectors that, that really could benefit from kind of what we um, are likely to see um, moving forward. Um, but, 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 you know, just because the financials are expected to do well doesn't mean that necessarily, you know, they're the, they're the sector that you want to invest in, right? Because, you know, a lot of that action could have already been priced in, right? And so this is essentially a graph that kind of shows you kind of how price to book um, compares against essentially um, uh, the, the value, right? Like kind of uh, return on equity. And so, um, and, and so you really want the, the prices to be relatively low for a much higher return on equity. And here um, in this particular graph anyway, you see that I think a lot of the sort of pharma, biotech airlines and in, industrials and healthcare are the, are the kind of industries that are still, um, that still enjoy relatively lower prices for potentially higher returns. So I'll conclude by kind of wrapping up this story that we kind of started out with, right? In terms of, um, you, know, um, you know, we really should expect these supply chain disruptions to continue, um, you know, because this new Omicron and, and a new Omicron variant that's just been announced in the news today poses additional risks to the outlook, um, you know, as well as the existing Omicron variant as it spreads throughout the world. Um, the shift shortage is likely also to continue, um, even as capital spending and inventory ramps up. So these are really the things that you, capital spending inventory, these are the things you really want um, in order to help resolve some of these shortages. 
The labor shortages and job mismatches, again, unlikely to be very difficult to solve, um, particularly for, for certain industries, right? Um, very difficult to resolve these issues um, quickly. Uh, inflation likely will be high for some time, um, but the Fed and you know, other central banks around the world will and have already started raising rates. And so markets that are pricing in these rates are causing the stock, stock markets to tumble, um, uh, none more apparent than I think what we've seen in, in the NASDAQ and in the Dow um, and, and the S&P in the past couple of weeks. So how do we see resolution, right? So the resolution will really come from a combination of you know, capital spending, um, shipbuilding, inventory management, right? That, that hopefully will eventually mitigate these issues. Not just hopefully, they will eventually mitigate these issues, right? And companies are very adaptable, right? They've already started looking at alternative sources. Um, even last year, you, you saw a lot of companies like Amazon, like charting their own ships, you know, doing all these different things, making use of air cargo, you know, um, you know, more frequently than, than they had in the past, you know, things of that nature, right? Um, and really, I think increasing the use of technology, I think that's gonna be very key. Um, the development and dissemination of vaccines, again, you know, I think it should aid in reducing the impact of Omicron and we're variants in the future. The hope is that this really becomes more of like the common, the flu, right, essentially. Um, uh, and in which case, you know, hopefully we'll also develop some resistance to it and at, at the same time be vaccinated. Um, and so, so there won't be the type of border closures, factory closures that we've seen in the past. And importantly, I think once we get over the pandemic and kind of its concomitant um, you know, social restrictions, we'll see a shift from goods to services. And this shift will, I think, then ease the inflationary pressures and the higher rates. Um, and growth will then bounce back as a result. So that's it for me, and I'm happy to take questions. So, so Dr. Wee, thank you for that. That was a fascinating presentation and a lot of great data. And we do have a number of, of questions that, that have come in. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask a, a question of my own. When you put up the slide where you showed the, the rate of inflation over the, the last couple of decades, it was interesting to me that past periods of high inflation, there was a buildup to it. Um, then it peaked and then it came down at about the same rate as the buildup. When you look at the, the raise in inflation today, I mean, it shot up straight up almost overnight and, and it's at a peak. Is it your expectation that that is going to come down as fast as it went up? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So I think um, the reason why you see kind of these more regular wave-like patterns right, or business cycles as you see it, uh, as, as we economists like to call it, right, is that a lot of those um, infl inflationary waves in the past were more routine business cycles, right, kind of the normal operating of the economy. As the economy expands, you have, you know, greater inflationary pressures, and as inflationary pressures go up, the Fed moves um, to counter that, right, and so then that these higher rates help to bring inflation down, right, because higher rates basically you know, kind of make it costlier to borrow, right? Make it costlier for, for, for companies to, to, to expand as, as quickly as they would with lower rates. Um, and that in turn lowers, lowers productions and, and, and eases inflationary pressures. What we've seen in, in the recent episode, right? Is that this is not a normal business cycle, right? The rate at which we recovered from that pandemic last year was absolutely remarkable, right? Like if you look at, I didn't plot GDP for you, but if you look at the GDP plot, you would see the same sort of, remarkable dynamic, right? Where the, 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 the bounce back was very significant, even more significant than the recent financial crisis. Um, and so I think that kind of points to the fact that the dynamic that we're seeing right now with, with, with inflation and with growth is going to be quite different than I think what we'd seen before in, um, in reg more regular business cycles of the past. Interesting. Um, so a question from the audience here has to do with digital disruptions. You know, we've all seen increases in ransomware and, and other forms of digital disruption. Do you anticipate that those kinds of disruptions are going to contribute to these supply chain challenges, um, inflationary periods and so on in going on forward in the future? Yeah, it's a, again, a very, uh, really good question. Um, I think the, the flip side, right, this is kind of, this question is the flip side of my suggestion, right, um, which I think a lot of companies are, are increasingly adapting in terms of adopting really, you know, um, better technology to try to combat a lot of the, the supply chain disruptions that they're seeing across the board. Um, the issue with, with, with better technology is that 
you know, or, or newer technology, I should say, perhaps is the, is the, is the right word to, to, to characterize it, is that you are more susceptible, right? So I think as, as we become more and more digitized, um, you are more susceptible to, I think, a lot of these um, ransomware and security breaches that we are seeing um, increasingly becoming more common. Um, and so, so I think that's, that's kind of, it's a double-edged sword, right? If you adapt technology, um, you get the benefits of higher productivity, but you also increase, you know, the risk of being, you know, kind of uh, hacked into or, 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 you know, being breached by, by a lot of these, um, a lot of these new elements, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I would say the technology still by and large, if you look at historically how supply chains have developed, I think technology is very much still a positive. Um, there just needs to be, I think, a lot of measures put in place to make sure that these, you know, security breaches, you know, um, and these, um, you know, type of events uh, are really mitigated, um, and that there is a proper cybersecurity protocol in place. Okay, so so the next question is um, looking for answers, Doctor. We can you can you help us solve the problem? The question is, what can local governments do to help mitigate supply chain disruptions? Yeah, so here I'll, I'll talk about kind of the chip industry, which I know very well, um, and I think it's, it provides a very good. Um, several case studies, in fact, of how what the local governments can do, right? So, so in terms of the chip making um, industry, there's really only a few big players, right? So I mentioned a couple of them earlier, TSMC, right? Um, Samsung is another very big player, Intel, obviously a big player. Usually they only concentrate their production in certain locations, right? So TSMC ha is building a plant in Arizona. Um, you know, it has plants in, in China, it has plants in Taiwan. But a lot, of, um, a lot of that production is very concentrated. Same thing for Samsung, right? Like Samsung has plants in certain locations around the world. Um, what local governments have done, so what Japan has done, for instance, this is a very clear kind of very recent example, is that they've basically courted TSMC. And this is like global competition now, right? Because India is getting in on it. A lot of other countries are getting in on it. Europe is getting in on it, right? Um, and what governments can do is they can essentially provide um, you know, a lot of uh, tax, tax incentives, um, research credits, right? Um, essentially, and, and direct funding to support the, um, you know, really the building of new foundries or fabs. These are the factories basically that make these chips, right? Um, and so if the government can work in tandem, so in Japan's case, it was actually a joint collaboration between Sony and TSMC. Um, and it was for the express purpose of serving their auto industry. So that was, that, that, that last piece, right? Serving its auto industry is very unique because usually a lot of the new fabs, the fab in Arizona, um, Intel's recently announced, again, plans to build one in Ohio. Um, you know, all these new plants typically are leading edge plants, right? They're not plants to build older chips, but because in Japan's case, um, the auto industry is so critical to its economic, um, to its economic growth, um, they made sure that they would have a plant that would serve, um, you know, uh, the needs of the auto industry. So I think, you know, that, that's just an example of what governments can do, right? I mean, they can certainly, and, and the Biden administration has done the same thing when it comes to chips, right? Like they've basically uh, created this, this, this program where they're going to have direct funding as well as a lot of these sort of research in incentives um, uh, and tax incentives to make sure that uh, the, the kind of local capacity is built um, uh, to serve local needs. So uh, we only have a few minutes left, so maybe uh, time for a couple more questions. Um, the next question is, uh, do you anticipate that, that these supply chain issues and, and the increase in profit margins that you've talked about, is that gonna stimulate new competitors, new competition for things like microchips and, and containers, you know, therefore resulting in more competitive markets? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think we're seeing that already, in fact, in the chip industry. Um, it's a lot harder, I must say, for, I think, you know, just thinking about manufacturing versus, or goods versus services, right? Especially high-end manufacturing versus, uh, you know, services. It's, it's a lot harder to make a chip plant. So, so to give you uh, some context, right? So it takes billions and billions, or tens of billions, in fact, to produce a new plant. And it takes several years to build a new plant, a new foundry in Arizona. Um, versus say opening a, a new barber shop, right? Um, you know, while, while, we eat, while we may value both things, right? It's just by, by the nature of the business, right? The fixed cost um, to create new capacity in ships, in chips, in a lot of these um, kind of big higher end um, or complicated manufacturing products, um, fixed costs are much greater. Um, and the time it takes to create capacity is, 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 is also much higher. So I think, 
that makes it a lot harder for, for things to move quickly um, uh, in, in those particular industries. But, but suffice to say, 100% agree that I think you are seeing this dynamic where even the smaller chip players are growing, right? Um, and as they grow, this space will become more competitive over time. Great. And then the last question that we have time for, uh, do you think that the attempts to onshore manufacturing are going to affect the supply chain issues? Yeah, another great question. Um, this is something that I think people are going to be, or companies are going to be increasingly doing over time. Um, it's, it's hard to do this quickly, right? Um, this is something that, you know, again, long-term investment, right? You don't just onshore things um, because of a short-term need, right? I think that's the key thing to note here, right? Is that to the extent that we believe that the pandemic will be resolved, say in the next year or so, um, you know, as, as a CEO or as a CFO, are you willing to then commit to that long-term investment of, you know, bringing things in-house or, you know, uh, switching your, your suppliers around if you feel that this will eventually pass, right? And that you have sufficient inventory to, to, to essentially um, get you over this wave, right? So, so while it's true that, and, and I think we are seeing, there are a couple of very clear examples of that. I mentioned Tesla earlier. I think that's a clear example of, of, of a company that's really tried to streamline its, its, um, its supplier network. Um, and there are other, many other um, examples that I could give, but I won't in the interest of time. Um, the, the, I think the, the main message is that companies will not only necessarily onshore, that, that will certainly be a strategy for some is to onshore. I think what they will also explore are these alternative sourcing strategies. So China plus one makes a lot of sense, right? So if you don't want things to be concentrated in China, you would have alternative operations in Vietnam, Malaysia, a lot of these other countries. Um, there's also the, the ability to, to you know, source kind of you know, regionally as opposed to locally, right? So, so here in the US, you know, we're fortunate enough to have you know, Canada and Mexico as immediate neighbors, right? And in a lot of cases, the supply chains are linked right, across these countries. Um, and so there could be a, an increasing reliance on that as opposed to needing the goods to be shipped all the way from Asia. So, so I think there are a lot of different ways by which companies can, can, can not just you know, sort of explore alternative uh, sourcing, but also streamline their processes um, to make sure that you know, they're not as dependent um, on these key suppliers. Great. Dr. Wee, thank you. Uh, I just want to take a minute and remind everybody, uh, if you're not already a member of the Maryland Tech Council Business Continuity Task Force, um, that is a group of senior executive mentors that have come together. Um, these, are, these are executives that have led companies through past economic downturns and have come together to assist companies in Maryland navigate uh, these financial challenges as well. Um, to date, we've assisted about 100 companies and uh, you know, we're, we're happy to talk with you and see how we might be able to help you get through these economic challenges. Um, Dr. Lee, your presentation today has been fantastic. Um, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's so important for our, our CEOs and leadership teams to be able to uh, predict and plan the future. The, the research, the analytics that you do are critically important to, to those decisions. So really appreciate your time today and really appreciate the work that you're doing. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. All right, well, thank you, everybody. It's uh, one minute past the hour, so we were almost on time. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Dr. Wee. Excellent presentation.